like that. So welcome, everybody. We are here today. I'm Sarah Seidelman, uh, author, shamanic mentor, and artist here with Inger Kenobi, who has written <clears throat> her second book, which is called Everything All the Time is Constantly Up to Me, The Journal of an Aspiring Writer. And you guys, it is such a treat. It's sort of written in this well, it's written in a diary style. If you've ever written David Sedaris's diaries and you enjoy that kind of fun, like you can read a little bit here and there. It's like a really easy read to come in and out of. Um, it's just so much fun. And Inger writes with so much comedy and so much clarity. And so, I mean, like your life is just fascinating. Like I, and I wrote a review on Amazon and I was just like, I want to be in Inger's life. You know, I don't want to be you, but you know what I mean? Like it's so many interesting things are happening and it's just so delightful. Um, so I just wanted to start with, I know, well, tell us a little bit, just briefly, like the basis of where this book came from. So it's interesting because it was like a book that was never meant. Well, first of all, thank you for that high praise. It means a lot. Um, but yeah, I started back like exactly almost 10 years ago. I decided to like draw a line in the sand, like it's time to stop just like, oh, I wish I was a writer and actually do something about it. But I didn't know what to do. So the only thing I could do was to commit myself to like, I'm going to make this happen, like come hell or high water, publish, write and publish a book. So because I didn't know, wasn't in a writing program, didn't know what to do, didn't really know how this whole realm works. Um, I decided I needed to start a blog because then I would keep myself accountable, like online. I, I think the blog had like three readers and then maybe later I had more, but it wasn't so much for the readers. It was more for me because I didn't want to see skip a day or I didn't want like, yeah, I said I wanted to write a book, but now I got distracted and, you know, started doing something else instead. Like it was a really like clear way for keep myself just really on track and you know, eyes on the prize and accountable. So that's how it started. I love it. Like kind of this funny external, even though there are not a million people on your blog, but you're just like, I'm just doing this and it makes me feel accountable. Like it's a sort of a, yeah, perceived accountability. And you wrote every single day, but not every single day is in the book, obviously. You, you called, you, you edited down some of it, I'm guessing. Yeah, because the idea when I started it, it had this like optimistic vision that it could happen within a year. Like I'm gonna like do this within a year, write and publish the book. Um, how hard can it be? But also I knew it would hard, but like I had no like sense of the time scale. but it ended up taking three years. So obviously I'm not gonna cram three years into a book about how to write a book, but also in the middle of writing the book book itself, not just being accountable on the blog, I realized that, writing every day and long passages every day and keeping up with the blog every day I actually took time away from the writing so as my book started to grow I started to like let go of the blog more and then I would just like write now and then just like the highlights sort of yeah well and I don't know I've always always curious as I read David Sedaris's diary and I'm so curious about yours like how much editing you did because it's like I mean, in my mind, I'm like, oh, she just flipped off this like funny, you know, really no great editing. Movie. No, are you kidding me? Yeah, there's it, no editing in that thing. There's like, I, I wrote, I started the blog, like I got up 20 minutes ex like earlier in the morning so I could write my post yes. before running and catching the bus to, into center of London where I was working. This, this is when my, I realized that I had the clearest, most like go, go, go mind in the morning. So that was part of my morning routine, just like, get it out there. There's going to be a lot of listeners right now who are like, damn, Inger Kenobi, now I really don't like you. <laughs> because it feels like it's edited. It doesn't, you know, often things when people sometimes spew a diary like thing, when you're reading it, you have the experience of you feel like your time is being wasted a little bit, or you're like, gosh, I wish they would get to the point or, but there's none of that in, in, in this, at least from my perspective, I just, I just like loved it. Um, I wanted to ask uh, another question. Oh, I know. You know, like if somebody wanted to do something similar to this, like, you know, just because I think observations, you know, we think our lives aren't very interesting and we would, you know, a lot of people say, well, I'd love to write a memoir, but my life isn't that interesting. But frankly, everything is interesting when you start paying attention to it and really, um, you know, 
make some, yeah, observe it. Um, for you, like how, you know, if you wanted to offer advice to somebody who wanted to do something similar, maybe they're going through a big thing, or maybe they've taken on the challenge. Like I'm going to become a painter. I'm going to become a writer. And this is it. I've drawn my line in the sand. Like what would you offer to them? I would say that what really helps is like, I had a really clear focus. I wasn't just like, if I had gone into it, like, oh, I want to be like David Sedaris and something like really funny. I don't think it would have happened because I didn't have a clear focus and also the pressure of like comparing myself to someone like him and like, uh, you know, horrible. But the thing that made it really easy for me that it was, it was just for me. I wasn't thinking about, will this get published? Cause it wasn't going to be a book. I wasn't writing it to inspire other people. I wasn't looking, I mean, to get like clients or selling, or it was just like so unfiltered because I wasn't thinking of like, this must lead to something like, so I felt like the stakes were really low. And I feel like sometimes when I talk to other writers, when they start writing a memoir or they want to write about like a journey, then they're like, oh, but who am I to know about this? And what do people don't like it and blah, blah. And I'm like, I had like liberated myself from all of that because I didn't think it was going to lead to something. And that was so I, my advice would be pretend it's never going to lead to anything and let yourself loose <laughs> on the pages. I love that. And I think that's why you come away from it loving the protagonist, like really falling in love with you as a person, because you're, you know, you're honest and you're um, transparent about your thoughts about things, your, you know, your dislikes of certain things and situations, you know, you're not holding back. And that's what really, I think makes for a great book because it just, yeah, you're just being yourself, which is so fun. Yeah, And I think that if I had been worried, like, oh my God, is like so-and-so going to read this? And what about my former colleagues? And what about future readers? And do I come across as a certain, like, if I had like, well, A, being in a rush in the morning, I couldn't entertain those thoughts, even if they were there. Like, like, it's just like, I'm too busy for you, you know, step aside. And also, again, because no one was reading it, like, yeah, well, if I thought someone was reading it, I wouldn't have written half the stuff I wrote. <laughs> so. Right, exactly. Or if you knew, yeah, like the greater public was going to read it. Um, no. Yeah, yeah. And you go through, I, one of the, one of my favorite scenes is when your mom-in-law is, is dying. Basically she's in a coma and everybody else is like, I'm out of here. This is the final hour. Like she's not doing well and she's yeah. maybe going to die. And then you just, you just leaned right into that and you just plunked yourself down. You got in there and you started sharing and talking to her and sharing with her favorite podcast that she loved. And like, that was just such a poignant, um, and touching moment. Um, and I just, yeah, it was just so inspiring. And I thought, it gosh, I thought really like that. Weird, it was a really weird moment in the sense that, I mean, it was obviously really sad and tragic and heartbreaking, but I also was really grateful that I had the kind of life I was thought of that often. I'm not sure if it came across in the book, but I had the kind of life where I could be there every day and spend time with her. I didn't have to commute from London. Like the hospital was maybe 20 minute drive away. Yeah. And I'm thinking like we had unplugged her. So you never know. It's not like in the movies where they take a breath and they die. You know, it could take, they said days. So, you know, anyway, so I was just like, I just felt so grateful that I was like, I get to be here with her. I'm not going to step away from this. So I just felt that mixture of sadness and gratefulness. Yeah. Yeah. It was really beautiful. And then just how you sprinkle in different teachings from your Buddhist tradition. Like, I can't wait for your next book because there's going to be much more of that, but like just the little things that you wove in there, things that your teachers had told you that were helping guide you as you were working through this, becoming a writer process. Um, so you say that, and you also wrote something about that. Like someone else mentioned that. And I'm like, what did I write? Cause I don't remember <laughs> doing that. You know, it's like, but it must be in there because it's such a big part of me. So you can't really filter it out. Exactly. Exactly. And I think what I came away with was just this, this kind of this journey of a person deciding they're going to become a writer and having the tenacity and the courage and the willingness to keep going at it. Like despite the frustration, despite all the doubt. I mean, I think there were like at least four different mentions, maybe a lot more of when you came back on a Monday or you came back after a difficult edit on the book and you're like, I think I should apply for a real job. You know, you never said a real job, but I think I better get a job, you know, kind of like that doubt sets in and it's like, what the heck am I doing? I mean, it just takes a lot of courage to keep going. 
It's impossible, but but I think that I was reflecting on this a little bit this morning, and I think what has really helped, maybe subconsciously in that process, is that I grew up on being read out loud, like a lot of books, a lot of memoirs, a lot of region fairy tales. And in those stories, fictional or not, there's not a single person who doesn't go through any obstacles on their way to doing what they really want to do. So like in the Norwegian fairy tales, there's always that classic like three obstacles. So first you have to go through the bronze forest and the silver and the gold, or you meet a one headed troll and then a two headed troll and then a three headed troll. So I kind of knew that the closer you got to the goal, the bigger the obstacle. But of course, in, in a writing journey or an artistic journey or any of those kinds of journey, the troll is like your, your own thoughts. Yeah. It's not an outer troll. So it's like the, the, the bigger, like now, oh my God, I'm almost at the finish line, but I can't make it work the way I wanted to. And suddenly again, this, when the stakes, you know, get so high, the inner critic enters the scene and, oh my God, I just wish I had a regular job. What the hell is wrong with me? Why did I think I could do this? And then you realize your thoughts aren't real. They don't get to have a say and you just keep falling. Yeah, keep going. And like, I remember as your uncle, finally you're getting kind of towards the end, but you're like, it's really, you tell you, you confess to your uncle, who's also a writer. Like, I just, this is just getting, I'm really bogged down. And he's like, he kind of gives you a warning. Like, don't let this get too bogged down. Like get it, ship it, kind of get it, get it going and get it out of here. <laughs> You've got to yeah, move he on. Like he was just like, yeah, do you really think, and he didn't say these exact words, but the message is basically, do you really think about clinging to it and nitpicking <laughs> at it? It's going to make it any better. <laughs> you know, he's like, release it. Like, enough of this madness. And he's like, this is how I, he's an artist though, right? So, but still like, you can't hold there and be so precious. At some point, you're just going to have to like send it out there. Whether it's a song you're writing and releasing, whether it's a painting, like, I mean, I know sometimes like when people buy a painting, all of a sudden I look at it and I'm like, oh, it needs a little more over here or something. Right? Like, right? What if I, what if I switch it and it's not what they paid for, you know? Um, so incredible. Uh, let's see, what else do I want to ask you? I mean, what's, how has it been, I guess, releasing this very private reflection out into a larger, I, you know, I'm presuming, you know, people are starting to get back to you and let you know what they think about it. And what has that felt like? Well, what was really shocking to me, and this ties back to the whole nitpicking and holding back is that, you know, I think we all grown up in a culture, like the more effort you put into it, the better the result, more work equals more value. And like I said, this thing, I just like fired off, like ugh. some passages was maybe like, I was like sitting in it, mulling on it a little bit, but in general, there was like zero editing. And um, the only thing I edited for this book is if something was unclear and it made no sense, but only to me. But in point, point is though, is that I realized that, oh my God, people seem to like things that I haven't worked, you know, over to death or processed to death or edited to death. And it's like, this is an interesting thing. I never would have thought that to be the case. And I was just like, how bizarre. <laughs> and not like, you know, so, oh, yes, then we get all this get to be slackers. But I think that you grow as you go. So maybe the first passages were a bit more raw and not blah, blah, blah. And you, but you, the more you do it, the better you will get. But that doesn't mean you have to go over the same material a million different times in order to make it better. Maybe actually just like leave it be. Is a, is, a, is a good way to, you know, like, like at some point you just have to stop with the craziness and like, yeah, this is good enough. This is as good as I'm going to, you know, send it out there. And yeah, people, yeah, people are liking it, which is like surprising and also really fun. <laughs> and it's a different kind of format, right? It doesn't have to have so much structure. Like if you're writing like your, um, your book, um, what I will, no, I'm going to get the right name right now. How again. do I look? How do I look? you know, that requires some structure. And I remember thinking, wow, this book is like so well-crafted and so amazing. And again, not a moment wasted. Like as a, as the reader, you feel like every word has been just carefully picked. Every paragraph has been carefully thought, you know, you, you never feel like your time's ever being wasted. And, um, I think that comes from that polishing process that you obviously were doing, you know, yes. during. Yes, it's true. Like a diary um, format is extremely forgiving because you don't need yes. to keep a plot line. You don't need to like, you can jump from random topics. Like one minute you're like, like I was one moment. I was like at the Cheltenham Literature Festival, seeing Margaret Atwood. Next thing I know I'm at the hospital. My mother-in-law is dying, you know, in a coma. So it's like nothing needs to be woven together in a logical 
coherent way because that's just life and that in a diary uh, format allows for that but when I was writing how do I look I realized like oh my god I don't have a structure and I actually ripped that book apart three times before I came up with the structure that worked for the book um and I was like okay this is the structure it needs but it took because so, I didn't know you needed a structure I and then I realized that I was like repeating myself a lot and it was all over the place and the threads didn't come together so Yes, that took a lot more polishing and work because it was a different type of book. Yeah, and all that. I think what I was struck by in the end is like, yeah, real writers, people who really devote themselves to this craft. I don't want to say real writers because I guess it's like we can all we can all dabble in writing, but those who really become devotees of this art, this craft, it's like it takes um it just takes 10,000 hours and then more you know and it it's really you made a point in the book that you you now understood now that you were able to devote you know 8 hours a day or 6 to 8 hours a day to writing that how hard why it was so hard when you were working another job to come home and write really well because you're, so much of your consciousness was taken up by work yeah, and also just like, I'm not a night owl. I always wanted to be a night owl. So I was kind of picturing myself that, you know, coming home from work after being busy and then commuting for an hour. And then it's like, you know, and then I could write until midnight. But my brain kind of just like shuts down. It turns into a pumpkin at like around nine. So even <laughs> if I had more time in the evenings, it's like, my, it's like, it's not how I function. So I just realized, you know, in Big Magic, Elizabeth Gilbert says, don't give up your day job for writing. And I'm like, I had to give up my day job for writing. It would never have happened otherwise for me in my personal journey. I've heard that from more than a few people about whatever art they're in, like until they decided to just fully devote themselves to that one thing. That's when it, then things really got good for them. Yeah. That's when you really get to like, because why wouldn't you want to like dig your teeth into it, really go for it. And you get to see see the process what happens when you get to sit with something for like hours and hours on end and like really like sink into the layers of the process in a deeper way that just won't happen 10 minutes here and there it's a start but for me that's not how I was able to weave the whole thing together yeah well it is it's just a wonderful book so everybody should go get their copy and right now you guys it's 99 cents which is insane at Kindle. Um, and the title of the book is Everything All the Time is Constantly Up to Me, The Journal of an Aspiring Writer. And I'll put it in the links below. Thank you so much, Inger, for coming to talk to us about it. Thank you, Sarah.